I do. Yep. Yep. I see you. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to my sec tonight. Um, I'm very glad to see all of you here. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about recon. It may not be exactly how you all might think of recon, but it, it is going to be about a type of recon. I am Esquire Trick, and I'm just going to be kind of moderating this, and I might be throwing some stuff in, in here. Um, we have... Uh, we have several other people that I will be asking questions of who have, um, they, they have careers in cybersecurity, they have careers in IT, and I, I wanna try to share with people like where IT people come from. I, that's a question I know that everybody, um, everybody's really interested in because IT people are a little different than other people sometimes, which is why like, these are my people. And I want to try to like, get it out there where we all come from. Um, let's see. So this, uh, this presentation that I have is set up a little bit different. I'm expecting that this is going to be something that um, is intertwined with other presentations throughout the rest of this year. This isn't going to be something where I go through a presentation, point out all the, the cool things on, you know, that I'm doing on a computer or something like that, um, and then the presentation is done. This is meant to be something where we start to uh, build a little bit more of a community and we build a little bit more of um, a, some momentum with how we're, we're doing these presentations and just the things that come out of my site Grand Rapids here. Um, so I have on this agenda, there's the who am I, who are we, that's the basics for tonight. We have uh, next month, we, we have a consultant from the SEC group that will be joining us, Sophie Blanchard, and she'll be giving a talk um, for us next month. Um, in between, sometimes we don't have uh, set presentations that are, are like somebody from Chicago coming up to, to give a presentation here in Grand Rapids. Um, so in between there, we will be talking about uh, current events. Um, we'll, we'll then go on to talk about some uh, network scanners and some examples and start working into like, what do you need to know to make what we see from the network scanners make sense? And then we'll start talking about vulnerabilities versus exploits and how we can take advantage of those when we're looking at the information. But that's like down the road and then we're gonna continue on through that. And um, I'd like to see us uh, related that to like the attack matrix and some other frameworks that are out there so that we can get a little bit more into the, the red teaming side of things in some of these talks. Um, and I see Richard is over here clapping, which is, you know, I, I'm excited about it as well. Um, so while we're doing this, if any of you, whether you agree to be on the panel or not, have any question for anybody on the panel, please say, hey, I got a question, you know, or just like shout it out. Let's make this interactive. Let's. Uh, you know, like all participate, and um, I'd like to make sure that everybody who's got questions is getting questions answered, and anybody who's curious about anything, I mean, we can always say, well, I'm not willing to talk about that if it ends up being one of those things. Um, yeah, so let's move forward. Um, so with this recon, uh, it's not just about the hacker activity of recon. It's not just about what a, a black hat might do or a white hat or you know, whatever color hat you want to wear. 
My mom is uh, nearing 80 years old, and she's one of those women that likes to wear red hats everywhere. And I always think that that's fantastic because, you know, I grew up in red hat um, in, in a different sense. Uh, so when we're, we're looking at networks and we're looking at environments and we're, we're looking at how we're going to head test them, how we're going to try to figure out what vulnerabilities are there. And when I speak, I'm always going to be speaking from an ethical hacking perspective. Um, yeah, sure, we all will. <laughs> we all will. All of us, you know, that we're, we're all from that thread here tonight. Um, yeah, when we're, we're looking at environments, it is just as important that we understand people um, as it is that we understand the technology that we're trying to get into. Uh, people tend to be the weakest link in any environment, but people are also our strongest ally in every environment. So it's important that we're, we're not just looking at the technology, which, you know, I, I had introduced that we will be going into a lot of that Red Hat kind of uh, technology or a lot of the Red Team um, kind of technology items. But I wanted to, us to start off with the people side of things. So I've come up with some questions. Um, I have the who am I slide. So I am a square retreat. I am a uh, cybersecurity expert in there. Expert in there. Yes. Thank you. Um, I am a cybersecurity project manager. I'm a security engineer. Um, I really like to think of myself as somebody that brings people together from different business units, from different uh, departments, just uh, different areas of the, where I work. And I inform them about IT and cybersecurity and how to make it work. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Esquire, without naming your company, how large is your company? How many people work there? And do you know how much revenue your company makes every year? Just to give the room and stream an idea as to how the, the, the environment you work in. Um, the, I mean, anybody can go find me on LinkedIn and they can see where I work. I work for L3 Harris Technologies. Um, we have, I think, somewhere around 50,000 people, 80 different business units. Um, I really don't know the revenue somewhere in the lot range. It's more than I have in my pocket, and but not as much as some of you have in your pockets, I'm sure. <laughs> no, it's, it's a pretty big company, and I really enjoy working there. Um, they have a, a great culture where, you know, if I see something that needs to be done in the business, I can bring that to my managers, and I actually feel like they're going to make, they're going to they're take it seriously. They're going to actually make an effort to uh, remediate whatever issue I brought. Like it's it's a really good culture. I work with a, a great bunch of people. Um, yeah. So thank you for that question, Richard. Um, I have a bachelor's. Of science, and yeah, I'm reading off of the notes because I don't even know what my degrees are. And stuff. I have a Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity and Information Assurance. I have a Master's degree in Information Technology Management. Um, along the way, I have my CISSP, the CCSP, the PMP, the uh, ECES, which that was actually part of one of the college courses that I took, and I didn't even know there was an encryption specialist certification until I took a class and went after it. Um, and the ECIH, I had my certifications. In the past, I had Cisco certification, Microsoft certifications, pretty much any vendor that was out there a decade or more ago. And I, I've, I've held a, a lot of those certifications as well. So with that, I, oh, I, I also do do some teaching as well at the college level with um, various colleges and universities. Um, so 
Take a quick look up here, guys, because you have to memorize the questions really quickly. And I'm going to the next slide. And uh, okay, so it's just the first section of questions because I thought I spread it out a little bit. So it wasn't such a cluttered screen. Um, for those of you that have volunteered beyond this panel, if you could give, um, like, just go through these questions. Uh, actually, let's, let's do this one at a time. Did you have a, a suggestion? No, I just was going to volunteer to go first. Okay. Um, so, Richard, could you go ahead and give us your name as much as you want? Yeah, my name is uh, uh, Richard Maloli II. I am the second. I have a father. Um, so my professional degree is in information security from Davenport. And my favorite certification was the Red Hat System Administration certification because it's all hands-on. doesn't matter how you get the final answer as long as you get the final answer. Uh, most difficult... Uh, most difficult would probably be any of the VMware and Citrix certs because they're looking for answers that they want, not what actually matches the real world. So what do I do? I am a senior security consultant at OST here in Grand Rapids. My day-to-day -day job is to go into organizations, big, small, doesn't matter the industry, and scan for vulnerabilities, scan um, or any in an issues in the environment, give them full recommendations for remediation and help guide them from where they are today to where they should be tomorrow. Um, I've always been a hacker, so that's what drew me to this job. Um, ever since my first computer, I wanted to break into systems and I wanted to do it legally after some questionable activities. So now I get to legally break the law because people pay me to do it. Always a good thing to do. So that is not breaking the law because you have permission and well, but it's still a tech. It's a technical <laughs> thing, you know. Uh, significant memory that helps you know this is a good deal for you. Um, so years ago, um, I was you know doing some hacking and uh, I was doing some scanning and I had an email server running through my house. And, you know, this is back when I didn't have a domain name, just the IP address, my Comcast address back then. And I was doing some scanning and uh, within five minutes, an email showed up into my inbox from a sysadmin. He said, stop scanning me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is the job I want. So I've been pursuing that ever since. Very nice, thank you. Um, Dan, would you like to go next? Sure. You want to come up right here because my microphone is. It's back oh, you can just down. come up here too. Sure. That works. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dan. Uh, as far as certs go, uh, UMCISSP, which this guy helped out with. Um, as far as most difficult, probably that one because I had the, this guy. No. <laughs> Uh, other than that, I got some industry certs. Um, I, my official job title is uh, security, senior security services engineer. I work for a company called CyberArk. Uh, basically, we're in the identity access management space. Um, I mostly work with uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. We're in a lot of financial services, in energy, retail, um, also government, stuff like that. So mostly with Fortune 500 companies. Um, I do everything from consulting, health checks, any type of technical upgrade, migration, technical issue. I get called into all kinds of stuff. Work with everything from secure DevOps to you know anything from on-prem deployments to on-prem environments. Stuff in cloud, um, trying to uh, um, Stay mostly in the on-prem or uh, self-hosted environments for uh, for customers. Um, as far as like what kind of uh, got me drawn into that, or just into IT in general, I mean, I kind of cut my teeth probably as a, as a youth, uh, like everybody else. Um, you know, I just kind of realized it was an obsession. As far as when security kind of came into the the mix, I don't know. It was just kind of like something that kind of grew out of curiosity. Got into plenty of trouble as a youth. Um, 
and that kind of uh, shaped me as an adult when I, as a young adult, when I saw some friends make some terrible, uh, terrible mistakes and alter their lives pretty severely for a while. So um, from the get-go, um, I just kind of realized that uh, I, uh, you know, I had a quite a bit of knowledge and um, just basically kind of started on a path, worked, cut my teeth in MSPs for several, several years. Uh, ran my own consulting business for a while, uh, but then ultimately decided that I wanted to do security full time, and uh, eventually fell into the role that I am right now. So, yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, as far as a significant memory, though, I mean, I I really just don't don't have one that comes to mind. But um, I'm sure I might be reminded later on. But yeah. Yeah. If you think of it later on, sure. Just yeah. Type in. All right. When the whiskey flows, the yeah. memory grows. Yeah, uh, that's what we should we should have whiskey here. And everybody just each time somebody speaks, take no. That'd yeah, probably be a bad idea. idea. Yeah. Not all ideas are good ideas. Yes. Okay. So that would not work. Um, so I was just noticing, uh, how are you drawn to that job? I, I hadn't addressed that earlier. Um, so I, I'm also one of those that I, I started messing around with computers back in the Commodore 64 pet computer, Commodore Pets days, and uh, also like going into the Tandy 1000s. And I remember there was, um, this is kind of a significant memory tied into how I was drawn to this job. I, re I remember I had, was learning how to do some programming with some friends because we would take the Commodore 64 magazine and we would type out whatever code they had in there so that we could make a ball bounce around the screen. Um, and uh, when I was in middle school, I had the option to be in band or to take a typing class. And I was tired of practicing my trombone. So I uh, went to take this typing class and somebody was throwing spit wads at me or pencils or something. And I took it and I threw it back and I got caught. So I had to stay back in typing class where they had recently gotten computers. Um, and the, the teacher, like at the, the end of the day when I had to go back to the class, the teacher told me, that uh, I needed to type out 500 lines of I will not throw things in class. Well, I was a young, I was a young budding programmer at the time. And so I did a quick, you know, loop and um, had, when, as soon as she walked out of the room, I just typed up, uh, you know, so it would um, number each line and say, I will not throw, uh, throw things in class or something along those lines. And uh, when she came back, it was scrolling down. I like pressed enter, and it was just scrolling through. She walked in. I pretended like I was typing, and I was done. And she's like, "I don't know how you did that, but it, you're gonna have to type this all over again." So I didn't get away with anything, but I just thought that that what that moment where I could use this in a way that wasn't expected. I thought this is pretty cool. And then from there, um, watching the movie Hackers back in the early 90s. Hack the planet. Hack the planet. <laughs> um, I, I remember watching the bad guy in the movie who was a corporate security officer. And I saw all the, the toys he had. And he had these huge computers that he was telling people, you know, like, this is how you secure this. This is how you keep out these other hacker kids, which I thought they were pretty cool, too. But I thought, for a job, that would be an amazing job just to be a part of a corporation and actually figure out how to keep hackers out. Because you, you understand how to hack, but you also understand how to, like, protect an environment. Like, that, to me, was amazing. So that's where I was like, okay. I need to I need to go into cybersecurity at some point somewhere along the line. So, all right. So moving on, and Drew, hey. how's it going? Yeah, I'll stand up there. All right, come on up. Plus, this app is making fun into something that will avoid paying. 
<laughs> Those would be my eggs that's trying to boil too. Uh, so my name, Andrew Thomas Rosema, senior. I didn't think you got to be a second until you had a third. So I'm just a senior. Um, degree certification is past and present. Uh, got an undergrad from an associate's degree from beautiful Grand Rapids Community College. It took me about 10 years. Um, but I had already, I liked computers as a kid too. And I kind of fell into a job fixing them for Tandy Corporation's uh, Computer City, if you remember that, out on 28th yeah. Street and running their service counter, which was sort of my entree into like getting paid to play with computers. Um, which is, I was getting paid, so who needed a degree? But eventually um, I went back and finished a bachelor's degree from Capella University. They're mo mostly an online school out of Minneapolis. Um, for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, went on and got a master's degree from Boston University. I think I wanted to spruce up my resume some. And then- Wait, um, how many master's degrees do you have? Just one. Just one. Okay. Buddy. I might have a second one from Purdue here before too long on my way to my PhD. And I did spend some time at the Sands Institute. So I, I had my, my, like transcript now is from like seven institutions and I have a lot of credits. I just don't have a PhD yet. That's so a you're a professional academic. I am. I am. Well, if you can call it that. And I am as close to a professional as academics get. How's that? Um, favorite cert. So um, my favorite cert and the most difficult cert was um, the, the old LPIC, the Linux Plus certification. And I don't know if it was especially difficult, but it taught me um, to not be quite as cocky as I am, or at least tried to, because um, when you start teaching, and I had just started teaching, uh, you find out that the CompTIA guys will give you opportunities to take their tests once a month for, for nothing. So I was like, cool, I'll just sign up for a bunch of these things. So um, I signed up to take, the LPIC was two tests, it was like LPIC 1, LPIC 2, and now it's Linux plus 1, Linux 2. I'm like, Psh, I've been using Linux for 20 years, I got this. And so I signed up to take the LPIC 1 at noon and the LPIC 2 at 1 to just knock this thing out. And I don't know if you've ever taken one of those CompTIA tests, but you finish the test and the lady out front comes to you with a printout that shows your score. Yeah. And so I went in and just bombed it. Bombed it. They wanted you to do things like memorize the switches for Grep and Hawk and Set and stuff like that and have them memorized. So uh, I didn't. And it just got roasted on the first one. And then I had to like turn around and go back into that room and get roasted on the second one as well. I later came back and took them. Um, but it did kind of nicely illustrate that point you guys were making about some certifications really want you to be able to answer the things you would see in a book. And like if I had access to a command line while I was taking that, I could have told you what the switch for cut was that told you the number of spaces that you were cutting from a command because I would go to the cut man page or I would forward slash help. But, right. or dash dash help. <clears throat> so what do I do? Now I'm a, a, a cybersecurity educator. I like to say par excellence sometimes when I do that. Um, but I teach the the gambit of the cybers things. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I, I um, sometimes work for the ISC squared. So we did a CISSP prep course um, outside of my work here at GRCC. Um, I teach for uh, the U of M's um, cybersecurity bootcamp program. Now that I don't have to drive to Ann Arbor because Zoom is a thing, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, let's see. So that's what I do. Um, I, I still occasionally consult, but um, there's enough teaching work these days. I don't really feel like I need to run around and find extra work. Um, how did I get drawn to teaching? Uh, well, there's two stories: how I got drawn to the cybersecurity aspect of things, and then how I got drawn to teaching. The cybersecurity thing was, I used to work for the Tribune Company. They own 513 here in town, that's where I started. And um, I was sort of the the youngest IT kid when, does anybody remember the I Love You virus? Mm -hmm. Or the Code Reds? Mm -hmm. So like when those things were popping off, I was doing IT, and they were like, quick, find somebody to do cyber before they even called it cyber. So they actually sent me off to um, like my first SANS 401 class in 19... No, 2000. Early, early 2000. Early, early part of this millennium would be a good way to it. And so that's how I got into um, the cybers part of it. Um, the teaching part of it was Linux again. I was, I was managing a bunch of people at Tribune, and one of them was taking a Linux class here. And he kept coming to me for tutoring. And uh, he said, you know, they really have problems finding adjunct teachers to teach Linux. And I was like, I'm going to do that. 
and I came over here and did it. And like the rest is history. I was like, this is lots of fun. So are you saying that you use a lot of Linux at Tribune then? At Tribune? Um, yeah. Like the, uh, a lot of, like a lot of black boxes are just Linux boxes under the hood. So a lot of the devices in broadcasting, when you get down to them, including the Harris transmitters were um, Linux machines when you, when you popped the hood over and started doing things with them. Um, and then a significant memory that helped me know this was a good field for me. I don't know. I, I think, um, like you were saying, Esquire, um, I tell my students these days, like, I don't remember learning how to walk. I remember learning how to swim. And I don't remember learning how to code. Because, like, I had a, a typewriter my dad gave me to tear apart that had, like, an LCD. And you could, like, make the stuff, make the characters move around on it. And it was broken, but the LCD still worked as a, as a little kid. And then my first computer was a Commodore 64. And I credit whoever sold that to my mom at the garage sale for kind of getting me into the BBS scene because it came with boxes and boxes and boxes of pirated games and a coupler modem and the number to a bunch of local BBSs, one of which was run by Darcy Swope, who still works for Grand Rapids Community College and her husband. So that was kind of what got me into the scene, if you will. Um, but has anybody ever heard the 10 hack commandments from dual core? Dual core is a nerd core hacker rapper. I have not heard. We should, we should, we should, that should be our outro music. Um, but um, one of the things that I learned as a young person in that scene was that you just shut the F up and you don't go to jail. <laughs> so um, that was kind of what, what got me started. And that was what really knew that like this was the thing for me. Like I got that thing, had a whole universe that just opened up to me on all those, you know, floppy disks, those literally floppy, floppy disks, those five and a half inch bad boys. Well, make sure five and a quarter. Five and all right, three and a half. Beautiful. All right, let's see. All right. So while you were talking, I was noticing, oh yeah, there's favorite search and most difficult search. So I think my favorite search to go after was the CCIE security, um, which I never actually passed the lab for the CCIE security. Um, however, I, I went after it in version three, and by the time I went to go back after it again, it, would, it changed over to version four. So I had actually been studying all the version three material, but you know, new hardware comes out, new new OS has come out, and there, there's new commands, new just new things that they're always adding. So by the time I was ready to go take the lab, because I I had passed the um, you know the written version three and attempted the version three lab. And by the time I felt like I was ready to go back from the version three lab, they had switched over to version four. So I was like, all right, now I gotta go take that written. So I read went and took that written and then kind of just let it drop after that because it was a lot, it was a lot of hard work to try to, you know, get everything that you knew needed to know for the uh, CCIE security. But I really enjoyed traveling to uh, San Jose and to North Carolina because I tried it multiple times. Um, I really did enjoy going there and just having that challenge of seeing all this technology and having somebody come up with this fake network and put errors in it and problems in it and then having you try to run through and fix all of that and, and just look at all the data at like a really deep level. I, I loved it. Um, but I would say the most difficult cert for me, even though I never actually passed that lab, was the, the PMP because the PMP doesn't, they don't have exact answers. I didn't feel like it was always just one of these is right and the rest of these are wrong. It was this one's right, this one's a little more right. This one's really not right. And this one's really, really right. And you had to figure out which one of those rights was the right right. And so that that part right there, like really, as I was taking the test, I was like, okay, come on. I need to be able to you know, discern this. And that was difficult for me. Um, Steve, would you like to come up here? Yes, let's do it. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
My name is Steve Martin. Uh, yes, I am a wild and crazy guy. And I guess my path to getting into cybersecurity was a very long path traveled to many different places. So uh, my degree is actually in chemical engineering. So I originally went to college with the idea that I was going to go into med school, dental school, something like that. So I, I didn't want to just study a basic, you know, biology type degree where I would get out and, and really not have any foundation or uh, skills to get into like a more technical role. So um, did that. Right. Um, and then I was studying for my DAT to try to get into dental school. And I realized uh, all of my energy and time was kind of more so spent tinkering on my computer, learning how to code, um, you know, learning how to pirate stuff from news groups a very long time ago. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> Can't tell you where I got it from or what I did, but, um, you know, so I kind of in a roundabout way got into the uh, tech industry. And so uh, when I realized that at the time I was uh, just kind of barely making it by in college. So my part-time job was at the Geek Squad. Um, so that's kind of how I got started, uh, in the industry. Um, and then to double check and make sure that I didn't actually want to continue in the medical industry, I went and worked in healthcare and IT and built some of the first, uh, generation telemedicine networks. So oh, th sorry. this was, uh, yeah, yeah, it was fun actually, but, um, this was before the days where uh, telemedicine consults were billable from an insurance perspective. So essentially there are a lot of really cool, like first generation pilot programs type things. Like, you know, some of the, the most successful programs were around, you know, things that you could attach like some sort of uh, echo machine or anything that had visuals, right? So like we did really cool programs around like high risk fetal telemedicine, um, you know, pediatric cardiology stuff. So essentially what the model used to be was you would have um, rural uh, areas that didn't have specialists, right? So you would have like a nurse practitioner out there or, you know, someone that was a specialist and they would come in and they would have a specialist physician, you know, back uh, in, in uh, like New Orleans, for instance, uh, reading this stuff live. So there was also some pretty cool stuff that we did with like the oil rigs and stuff. So if there was a really uh, critical accident out there, you know, the ER docs back uh, on base would be able to do that. So that's kind of how I got started in this arena. Um, so worked in healthcare, worked a lot in uh, utilities. So uh, energy and it was a nuclear operator as well. So there was a lot of really, really cool stuff um, that kind of, jolted me toward cybersecurity. So I kind of got my training wheels doing a lot of different things from, you know, working in like work group computing, networking, doing the collaboration uh, sort of stuff, um, you know, and then kind of went into more of like a program management type of role. So looking at the program, looking at the financial side of things, looking at the business impact. So, you know, that's when I started to kind of trickle away from being uh, solely focused in as an engineer. But as far as uh, my favorite, sir, you know, I can't really pick uh, one that I would say is my favorite. I, is it like I, picking your favorite child? Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. You know, I have three, so you, you can't really do that. Um, I'm a guy that likes constant change. And I think that's what really has drawn me to IT and technology in general, because I mean, our job right now in the cybersecurity industry is changing because of what someone's doing today that we're going to find out tomorrow, right? right? So that's what really kind of draws me to this industry more so than not. Um, you know, I've got a PMP, I've done the ITIL, um, uh, CCNP collab. I think that was probably the most challenging one just because the, the practical laboratory part of that for me was extremely challenging. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of those building blocks and all the different areas of IT that I've worked in has kind of built my career in such a way where I can look at things from a holistic perspective and kind of pull my heads out of the weeds a little bit. So uh, some different approaches there, um, 
you know, I guess cybersecurity just in general is in my blood. Both my parents come from the intelligence community. So uh, when I was a young lad, we've ha always had computers in our homes, had robots. Um, and when my dad came out to the private sector, he actually worked for Zenith Data Systems way back in the day. And so he had access to some really cool prototypes. So um, that's kind of what maybe have influenced me to kind of naturally lead myself here. So it, it was kind of a long trip, but um, so now I'm focused solely as a technology kind of advisor, consultant, um, working in the cybersecurity industry for a consulting firm called VDA Labs. And uh, we like to do a little bit of everything in cyber. So um, a lot of stuff is focused around application security. So anyone that's building a product, whether that is hardware or software, you know, there's services that, you know, we do that correspond to kind of where they're at, right? Whether they're just getting started with developing a security track or they're very mature, you know, we can do point in time assessments and a lot of other things. So um, that's kind of how the company started. And then we got into a whole lot of other areas like GRC and active monitoring stuff. So we have a SOC. And so basically what I like to do is meet with people understand what their goals are, how they're trying to achieve them, where they're at as far as their cybersecurity posture and, and just work collaboratively with them to figure out a plan, right? I mean, one of the biggest things that I think I really, really like about technology is people come from a number of different backgrounds, right? And so like, I see people in the tech industry that are highly successful that come from like very creative backgrounds, like a lot of musicians, people that are artists in, there is no right way to do cybersecurity, right? And in fact, in my opinion, the chaos there makes it a little bit more challenging for hackers to try to figure out exactly what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you have a cybersecurity framework like NIST or CMMC, that's just the building blocks to get there and how you create the program. It's all the secret sauce behind the scenes, the creative minds that come together that can help you really build defense in depth and, and be creative in your posture. So um, yeah, that's, that's me. So awesome. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Me too. All right. So we are already uh, quarter to nine. We got a little bit more time. We could do some of this. Um, so I'm going to shift kind of gears here. Um, these last three questions, what drives you, guides you forward? Biggest concern in cybersecurity from a technical perspective, most important, like most important security control um, and why? or at the biggest concern for our industry. Um, so for, for me, it's, I, I love technology that drives me forward, but I'm also, I also, um, you know, have a, a family su to support and that also drives me forward. And I, I like to work in a field where I think cybersecurity is one of those places right now where what we do impacts everyone around us. It's not just, it doesn't just impact the company that I work for. It, you know, when, it, when a hacker wants to get into a system or a, a nation state's trying to get into, you know, a system or, you know, any APT out there, they're not just gonna go for the, the, the pot of gold. They're gonna go for anybody that they can connect in any way in that supply chain to that pot of gold or through remote workers or through just anywhere where they can find that weakest link. And so I, I'm just um, really, I, know, I feel passionate about that we need to be securing everything from you know, our major corporations down to trying to figure out how to help out the mom and pop shops. like trying to secure them all with still um, giving them the freedom to do the things that they need to be able to do. Um, 
So uh, that kind of brings me back to the, uh, from a technical perspective, the most important security controls and why, and the biggest concern of our industry. Um, for, for me, I think that the thing that pops out for most important security control is right now MFA. Um, it is difficult for, well, from an insider threat, there is the role-based permission, but it's really hard to say an individual security control that's the most important. Um, you know, like all of our endpoints, like we, we need to have good encryption and VPNs for anything that's outside of our network. We need to have good firewalling in inside of, well, for each machine, like host to host firewalling between machines. Like I'm gonna go back to MFA because I think if everybody had MFA, then there would be a lot of low hanging fruit that would be taken away from a, a lot of hackers out there or a lot of uh, APTs that are trying to get into stuff. Um, uh, let's go back to Richard. Yeah, um, what drives me forward is that this is my passion. Um, I believe that we all work together and, you know, be more secure together. If we all agree on principles and implement them, then the entire world is safer. By one million dollars tomorrow, I will still get my job because I believe in this. Um, my biggest concern from a technical perspective Vendors, um, vendors that don't follow practical security, vendors that refuse to change, vendors that say, no, I'm not going to support that after X years, vendors that just disappear. Uh, technically, that is the most pressing concern that goes in manufacturing and healthcare primarily. Um, security control and echo square, MFA. Um, MFA is the simple saying that any consumer, any organization, any person can do. But we need to make it simple and easy to use. And there are too many options right now. We need to simplify it. My biggest concern, um, insider espionage. And part of that is financially speaking. There are too many insiders, and it's also goes towards a, you um, know, supply chain impacts where it's way too easy for an insider who has all the control to be corrupted. Um, they can be corrupted financially, they can be corrupted via blackmail, etc. Um, there are too many secrets in this industry. And I know we all have our secrets, we want to keep it that way, but secrets equal blackmail and that is a concern. Thank you, Richard. Dan? Uh, so kind of echoing what you kind of said, you know, as far as like uh, uh, from a technical perspective in that, you know, like MFA or, you know, I mean, I come from the, you know, privilege access management world specifically. Can you hear me? All right. Okay, sure. Uh, so, yeah, what, I'll step I, I'm going to start over uh, to yeah. hear you. What drives or guides me forward? Um, I would say just the fact that uh, probably just the satisfaction to get out of doing my job. I can leave a place better than I came in uh, in, into it and uh, I've made uh, positive contributions, uncovered major uh, gaps, vulnerabilities. Uh, for instance, our product not configured the way it should be, uh, stuff like that. Um, I take a great lot of pride and satisfaction in that. Um, so really what I do, if I can make people, you know, uh, uh, stronger engineers, uh, more educated, if they get something out of engagements with me, um, I feel like, you know, I, that, that's the biggest of, of, of satisfaction for me is, is that and just uh, learning learning a lot, uh, getting to see different environments and that. Um, concern from a technical perspective, just kind of echoing before, I think identity is a big thing. Uh, you know, zero trust, I think, you know, kind of speaking more to the, the insider threat in that. Developing, you know, models uh, and also controls, technical controls to, uh, um, uh, to help deal with that. Privilege access management is one, especially making sure that every single thing that somebody does was something that's potentially 
uh, dangerous or could compromise an organization uh, is uh, audited and logged and uh, verifiable. Um, and yeah, biggest concern uh, for the industry, you know, yeah, I would probably have to say, you know, uh, insider threat is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, the uh, just the just the fact that um, you know there there are people out there who uh, could act maliciously uh, and uh, especially uh, you know have severe ramifications for a company is important. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Good. Thank you, Dan. And Drew. All right. What drives me forward? I think most people like. Is your microphone now? No. You. <laughs> I, my, my computer up there has a pretty good microphone array. Does it? But, uh, so, what drives me forward? Um, uh, the thing that I think, like most of us, I'm curious, and um, that keeps me fired up um, both as a student and as an educator. I like to learn new stuff. And uh, like we just landed this grant to take part in a big AI um, training program, uh, which apparently we'll be putting together classes on that. And the person doing that might be me. So I'm pretty excited to learn all about AI. So my machine learning chops could use a little development. So th like the fact that there's always new stuff, it, Sometimes I talk to my students about like a technology treadmill that you get on and it just does not stop. Yeah. I like treadmills, so <laughs> I, I find that enjoyable. Um, from a technical perspective, um, can I, I'm going to lump biggest concern from a technical perspective and biggest concern for our industry into the same thing. Um, the ability to anonymously move currency around mm. the planet is the reason we have ransomware and is the reason we are putting up with this. And the fact that we have allowed kind of this laissez-faire approach to cryptocurrency to happen has enabled uh, ransom, like literal ransom, drug dealing, encrypting people's businesses and, 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 and shaking them down for millions of dollars. Um, not seeing a big upside there. And I don't see any way around it because I think I'm pretty well versed on how the technology works on the back end that uh, there's not really much of a solution other than to legislate the hell out of it. So I think that's our biggest problem that people can move around millions of dollars anonymous, sued anonymously um, is huge. And it, it, it's the reason we're all terrified of having our organizations turned into, you know, encrypted things that we're being uh, audited for. Um, so the most important security control for that, um, I'm going to say education, because I have a dog in that fight. But um, the, 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 the biggest, what do they call it, the infinity day vulnerability, that is your users, um, can also be the human firewall that keeps your organization safe if properly trained. Um, so that's the biggest control. That. The, the human firewall. firewall. No, the, the infinity day vulnerability. The infinity yes, day they're, vulnerability. they're going to be a zero vulnerability from now until forever. That's actually why my academically, I'm not a strict like computer science nerd. I, I'm interdisciplinary because really 50% of the cybersecurity problem, 60, 70 is, is not in there. It's in the space between there and the chair. You know? All, right. All right. Those are my thoughts. It is. It is. Uh, All right. Steve, we'll, we'll end with you. On a high note. All right, probably, probably not on a high note. We'll, we'll try to make a note, though. How about that? Um, kind of what drives me forward kind of in this industry specifically is, you know, just safety in general, right? Um, you know, with autonomous vehicles, with aircrafts that are essentially autonomous as well, there, there's a huge safety impact to cybersecurity. So how can we systematically solve those problems, right? We all have to work together, right? So there is that whole problem inside of the, the cybersecurity industry is, you know, trade secrets, right? And ultimately that's what we're all trying to protect, right? So um, it really gets to be interesting, but that kind of drives me forward. And, and again, that constant change, constant ability to learn new things, right? Um, what I would say from a technical perspective and, and what I see pretty much every day from some of these security assessments um, that we do is uh, they couldn't be more correct with identity based solutions being probably the, the best way to protect an organization. Um, 
you know, there's a number of different ways to do it, right? Uh, what I consider security 101, you know, building those building blocks, MFA would be an extremely important thing. But, you know, after you're there, right, it's like, what do you do next, right? And there's a lot of different technologies that, you know, are just becoming, a, are getting to a place where they're maturing enough for them to be kind of commercially available. And so looking at behaviors of users, not only your end users, but also, you know, things in your infrastructure and how they should normally behave, I think is extremely important, but linking it back to identities, it's, you know, if a hacker is coming into your environment and they're manipulating uh, something in Active Directory or with an identity, what it is that they're doing that is an abnormal behavior that a standard user or an administrator wouldn't do to, to get there, right? So monitoring those behaviors, I think, is going to be an extremely important uh, trend uh, that will really push us forward as an industry, right? Because we have to have defense in depth, right? giving someone enough time and enough money and enough resources. And we certainly fuel them with our smaller organizations that don't really take cybersecurity serious, right? Because it's, you know, different footholds that they can take across anyone's supply chain. So uh, for instance, if you're just a mom and pop shop, but you're a supplier that then goes into a DOD contract and you're a prime supplier, like it might just be a little tiny building block of that tank that they're building, but you know, getting one piece of that might be the piece of the puzzle that they're missing, right? So, I mean, I think as an industry, we have to work together, right? And unfortunately, this world that we live in, everything kind of is around financials, right? And so we have to have money to do that, but we also have to agree upon certain strategies kind of from a government perspective to get there. So I think we're making some strides there. Um, my biggest concern for the industry comes from a little bit of a different viewpoint. Um, one of the things that I think has set us back tremendously, uh, cyber insurance, right? Um, from an insurance policy perspective, um, business owners look at risk in many different ways, whether that's, uh, you know, financial risk or a cyber risk, right? So uh, initially the cyber insurance industry came to a, a business owner and said, hey, instead of making all these investments to actually fix problems in your environment, to remediate vulnerabilities or to invest in better technologies to keep you safe, here's this insurance policy so that when you do get hit, we'll just pay you for it. Right. And so that I think has caused our industry to salt to kind of stall a little bit. Um, and that's kind of blown back up on them. So that's totally changing as we speak. And I've seen a lot of cyber insurance agencies now uh, mandating that people do the basic security of 101. So, um, you know, it's getting better. They started losing money and now they figured out a way to do it. So uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction. So. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. All right. So the, you know, I had said MFA and talked about some other things for those, but really, I, I think in our industry, we are lacking talent. We are lacking people who are educated to be able to actually do all of these things. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love like this organization, MySec. I love like anything where they're educating people. And this goes back to what you were saying, you know, our, we need more people that are both at the user level that um, can help support, you know, make smart decisions for, for cybersecurity. But as well as we need actual cybersecurity professionals. Um, so tonight we we met you know myself and Richard and Dan and Steve and Drew and I thank you guys for sharing all that you did about your careers where you came from. Um, and I want to encourage anybody who sees this who finds this interesting to join either an organization like this or come join us for these MySec meetings so that we can share our knowledge you know with you so we can learn from you as well 
Um, and I, I would just love to see this community grow. And if you see this online and you have questions and you want to like comment on the YouTube video or, on, you know, wherever you ended up seeing it, you know, start that conversation so that we can all be building this community and making this community better. Thank you all for, for watching and thank you all that, that came. I, I appreciate you all being here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And